So many of you. Well, I just okay. found out before that I did need to use a microphone because the sound gets hollow towards the back. Right. So I'm... can you hear me at the back? No. <laughs> There's always one. There's always one. So I'll, I'll, you okay. can have that one. No. Oh, did I not turn it? I've unmuted it. <laughs> Try it now. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me at the back? Okay. Good. Okay. Right. We're going to be in business. I should sit next to my little goodies. Okay then. Um. Oh God! I frightened him away. You're supposed to be looking after me. We're going. We're looking after. Yeah. Oh, um, Richard, look, just to kick things off, I thought I might just ask one quick question and then maybe throw it out, out to the, uh, to the um, hungry audience as well. Uh, maybe, uh, I was thinking, it's 1971, this was, my, this was one specific question I had in mind, it's 1971, I think, you walk into the, the first audition for Captain Michael Yates of Doctor Who. Did you have any idea at the time, I think it's 1971? That it was... uh, uh, yes, that's, that's correct, yeah. Did you have any idea at the time, I, I mean, it, it might have been... Um, big in England, I'm guessing certainly most of a certain demographic, um, but that it would get this giant and that you would be in Auckland in 40 years, giving, um, giving a massive... I do wish yeah. you'd stop adding up the years. <laughs> this is something I do as a mathematician. What a horrible person you are. I don't like you immediately, but I like that. And so like you. And, and so He's run away, you insult me. <laughs> yes, he's absolutely right. What's your name? My name's... My name's Albert. Albert. Okay. I'll send you to the lions. Do um, you know the, the poem about Albert and the lion? No, you don't. But don't worry, I don't know it either, actually. But, but it's about a little boy who was taken to the zoo, and he got a bit too close to one of the lions, and he was eaten. So watch it. Okay. Yeah, my name is Richard Franklin, by the way, and I played Captain Mike Yates on Doctor Who. Um, and um, you're absolutely correct, uh, in uh, 1971, which is a hell of a long time ago, uh, suddenly I got offered this part, and I had absolutely none of us had any idea at all that in all these years since, we, I, would, oh, that I would be here in Auckland. Um, it, it is an extraordinary television phenomenon. And in Britain, Doctor Who is the longest running series. In fact, it's one of the longest running series, if not the longest running series in the world. Uh, and uh, none of us realised we thought we were just doing another job. It was just going to be, uh, you know, one of those nice little television parts that you get. Uh, but it's... look at your... I have a, um, a quick, I'm going to ask my questions before you guys, just in case I don't get a chance. Um, <laughs> something I have a particular interest in is acting as a career, and you studied... Don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> and you studied at RADA. I did. Um, my understanding is at the time RADA had a particular focus on theatre in terms of your training. Was it still very useful training to have when you took into screen with you? Uh, RADA is a complete course. Um, and obviously it changes, it reflects uh, what's going on in uh, the world of entertainment. Um, but yes, I mean, its foundation is um, uh, Stanislavski, um, uh, the great Russian um, analyst, really, of, of theatre technique, acting technique. Oh, it's outside. I'm just going to ask you to turn it off. Um, but... Um, uh, Rada has always um, has has always um, had a basis in very sound um, theatre training because that is what sort of really what sort of real actors do. We like to entertain a live audience, um, and all these other things that have developed since uh, film, television, and so on um, uh, are sort of add-ons, if you like. But now the balance has gone the other way. Um, and I actually still do work at RADA. Um, we have a buddy scheme there, and uh, working alumni, of which I am one, I still work very hard, very busily, um, in the theater. Theater, television, audio, radio, film. Um, um, 
like they have alumni who are each allocated a, a, a leaving student, a final student, so that it gives them a connection with live working theatre, awesome. which is a very good idea, but it's given me an opportunity to see what goes on now at RADA, which has, uh, it's incredible. I mean, you know, obviously the emphasis is very much more on things like um, fringe theatre, because there's so many people out of work uh, in Britain, and I think probably uh, in definitely here too. All over, yeah, in New Zealand and certainly in America as well. Far more actors are out of work than are actually in work. And so we have to create projects for ourselves. Writing, uh, fringe, directing, off-Broadway, off-West End, whatever. Um, and so the, the, certainly there has been uh, that shift to television and film, uh, to the mechanical media. Uh, but it still has the root in stage acting. Um, and one last thing from me. Um, in doing a bit of research about um, your, your career and your life, something I thought that was interesting, and correct me if I'm wrong, you started in advertising and then went to acting school. You have been doing your research. I have, and something I think is very... <laughs> uh, the leap from advertising to this, this career that you have in, in affecting the, this industry is such a, a big turn for me. What, what made that turn? What did, you, were you, did you always have your roots in performing? No. Um, and I said I wasn't going to give you a one-word answer, and I won't. Um, no, actually, uh, I went to university, I went to Oxford, and read Philosophy, Politics, Economics, PPE. Um, I then got a degree in History, Modern History, and I was about to leave, and I still had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. And um, those of you, the younger members of uh, the audience here today, you probably haven't got a clue what you want to do. Most people don't have a clue what they want to do. How can you? How, do, how can we know uh, without trying? Uh, so when I left Oxford, um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. All I knew was that I had a, a father who had said that I was to do nothing to do with theatre when I was at Oxford. <laughs> uh, consequently, I didn't join any of the acting clubs, but I did everything else. Sculpture, golf, rowing, royal tennis, you name it, I did it. But I had nothing to do with acting uh, because I'd been told not to at Oxford, which is a great pity, great shame. Uh, so when I left, I was presented, in those days there were lots of jobs going, and there was a pile of job opportunities from offers from firms about that thick, literally. I went through them all, hadn't a clue what I wanted to do, I wanted to please my parents, but I'm very different from, certainly from my father, who is a, a very famous surgeon, actually, and a very long way from being in the theatre. And a very good surgeon too. Uh, but um, I suddenly saw this thing about advertising. And it seemed to have creative people around. And uh, I wanted to be with creative people. And it was also a business. So that looked fairly respectable from my father's point of view. So I went into advertising, thoroughly enjoyed it, became assistant, ended up as assistant TV producer and uh, scriptwriter for TV commercials. And. Uh, then I'm afraid the story, if you ask the question, I'm afraid it gets a little bit dark here because I had a younger brother who had an appalling illness, I won't go into it, which completely upset me and completely shook me. Um, and um, he, uh, he took 22 years to die, actually. It was appalling. And after seven months, he came home. Uh, he'd been in hospital for seven months. and. The morning, I tell you the story because it has a, a bright ending, a very bright ending for me. Um, the morning after he came home, I woke up and I had three thoughts in my mind, and this is literally true. The first is, I want to be in the theatre. God knows where that came from, but that is honestly my first thought, I want to be in the theatre. The second thought was, my father will kill me. <laughs> The third thought was, all my friends will think I'm gay. <laughs> and my fourth thought was, fuck them all. Ooh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I do apologise. You won't get any more. But
But my, my final, my, and it was literally those four thoughts. The fourth one was, it's my life and I'm going to lead it. Leave it. Uh, lead it. <laughs> Leave it. Not yet. Um, and, and that is a piece of, okay, has advice coming now. For God's sake, follow your heart. You know, if you want to, to do something. I, I had advice from two uh, actors, one who you may know, Susan Hampshire, who's a J. Arthur Rank starlet. She's an old friend of mine from before. And uh, John Standing. They didn't know each other. They both gave me the same bit of advice. When I went to them and I said, God, I've had this waking dream. I want to go into the theatre. Am I mad? I've got a really good job. I've been offered a junior directorship at the age of 26 in, in, a, in a leading advertising agency. And uh, they both said the same thing. Follow your heart because you wake up when you're 40 years old and um, you say to yourself, oh, I wish I'd done that. I could have been, I could have had this wonderful life. I could have been a star. I could have been whatever. And you'll take to drink. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, here I am. Thank you for that answer. It's a wonderful answer. Thank you very much for being so open and sharing. Well, there's no point in your asking questions if I don't give you straight answers. And when it comes to uh, the moment when, we, when you can ask questions to me, please feel that you can ask me anything. If I don't want to answer it, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that, who has a question? Right. I'll move straight up here. Um, I'm Dwayne. Hello, Dwayne. Um, it's a question about your costumes, actually. It's a bit geeky, but um, in The Demons, you got to wear your civvies. You look very flash in your sort of James Bond leather jacket. <laughs> very carefully chosen, those costumes. Yeah. <laughs> and by your last story, you were dressed slightly more happy-ish, shall I say. Um, was that your own um, choice of costume? Uh, well, sorry, what was I wearing in the, the, in, the, in your last story, Planet of the Spiders? You yeah. were wearing the flares and oh, yes. the long hair. It was much more hippie-ish. Um, was that what you would wear? Was that your choice? Uh, it was my choice at the time. I wouldn't be seen dead in it now. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, um, I, as you know, I always wore a uniform, uh, an officer's, a captain's uh, service dress uniform. Very smart and all the rest of it. But uh, I longed to get out into civvies. And um, the question, if for those who might not have heard it, is a question about my costume that I wore in Doctor Who. Usually I wore the uniform. I was taken on as love interest for Katie Manning, who sadly is not here, though I see a lot of her still. Um, but the Green Death, I think, was the first opportunity I was given uh, not to wear uh, a uniform, and I wore a, uh, I think I wore a suit in that. Or was it in the uh, uh, later story? But I did get into a suit. Then in my very last uh, episode, The Planet of the Spiders, with, uh, by that time, uh, Katie had left the show, and uh, Liz Sladen uh, had come in, and so I had another love interest. Um, um, so that was okay. Um, and um, uh, I was able to choose my costume. So I got what was the real fashion at the time. And frankly, it either makes me embarrassed or else I roar with laughter at it. Because I had a fringe and sort of long hair and flares and it was... Well, you know how fashion changes. I liked it. Thanks, Richard. Oh, you liked it? Yeah, well, I think you're beautifully dressed now. Do you want to stand up and show them? Show everyone how this is. If I could have found the corduroy pants, I would have worn them. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. If I could have found the corduroy pants, I would have worn them. Oh, he would have worn corduroy pants? Oh, of course, the pants are different in this part of the world, aren't they? Yes. That means a pants. Thanks, Richard. We've got another question over here. Just introduce yourself, right? Yeah. I'm Jaden. Um, have you ever been inside the TARDIS? Um, actually, no. Um, Mike Yates never was allowed to go into the TARDIS, um, which is a great shame. I stayed on Earth. But actually, that, that leads to, I, I think, an interesting point in the writing of Doctor Who. I personally think that the Doctor Who stories that are connected to Earth 
are more effective than ones that are totally onto another planet. Because you've got nothing to compare um, the fantasy with. I mean, for example, um, if you uh, go to the toilet now, and probably all of you are longing to get an escape, um, and you find a yeti sitting on the loo, <laughs> that is scary. But if you go to a planet where yetis live, and you find yetis around the place, it's, it's no wonder. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, I think the contrast was very nice between the very much sort of the Earth-rooted um, unit, United Nations Intelligence Task Force, of which I was the captain. Um, and I should, incidentally, I should be here with the Brigadier's daughter, um, uh, played uh, now by Gemma Redgrave, but uh, she's filming and, and couldn't come, which is a shame. So you've just got me, I'm afraid. Um, so that was the answer to your question. Yes. Good. Thank you. Do you watch uh, much of the modern, uh, modern, uh, modern Doctor Who's, Richard? Oh, uh, that came from you. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's the... yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sort of um, uh, not hearing very well this morning. I went in the shower and I blocked my ear up on one side. So that's you. Yes, uh, do I? Uh, not a lot. Um, as you know, there was a gap of ten years when Doctor Who was taken off the air because the producer had a personal dislike of the program. Um, and uh, actually quite a lot of people have a personal dislike of the producer. But um, uh, anyway, that's beside the point. Um, uh, do I watch the, the modern program? Um, uh, Russell T. Davis came in, as you know, and started the new series off brilliantly. And I think he was absolutely right to give it a different format with a very young doctor uh, to appeal to a new young audience and um, I think he did a really good job, um, and he wrote good stories. I have to say, I don't think that the story writing is up to the technology at the moment. Uh, I think the technology is probably the best on British television. It's quite, quite incredible, and they have a vast budget. It's the, the, Doctor Who is the BBC flag flagship show, and I mean, they spend a fortune on the technology, and it's really good. But it's overtaken the story, in my opinion. Uh, so I've made a point of seeing all the Doctors. I like Matt Smith very much indeed, and, and uh, David Tennant. And, um, but um, you don't have a show if you don't have a story. And uh, it's like trying to win the derby on, on a donkey. It can't be done, you know. Uh, actually, um, there is going to be a change at the top of Doctor Who early next year. Uh, there's a new producer, I think, coming in. And um, hopefully the writing um, will be more favourable to the actors, actually. Uh, in fact, Gemma, who should be with me now, I don't know whether I should say this, but I'm going to anyway. Um, I can't, I mean, she's a, a very good actress, and I believe, I've never met her actually, but um, I believe she's a very nice person. Um, but I, watching her work, which I did as a matter of research before I came out, thinking I was going to come out with her, I couldn't really understand her character, because, um, but that's not her fault, it's, it, it's to do with the writing. We had a brigadier, as you know, Nick Courtney, who was absolutely marvellous. And uh, Nick and my character and John Levine's character were very well conceived and written because they are absolutely typical of people that you find in the British Army. Uh, and thinking of Nick Courtney, uh, he was, you know, the, the, the bumbling brigadier and you know, rather, a, rather a buffoon. But he always managed to come out with the, the bright answer. So he's not quite such a buffoon as he looks. I mean, most, most of us English look pretty good buffoons, I think. And um, we try not to, but we just are. But we have got something underneath that. And I think myself that writing um, the Brigadier's Daughter in 
it would have been a good idea if she could have had some of the characteristics of her father. And I couldn't see any connection. Nor could, she was sort of wearing civilian clothes. I couldn't understand who she was or what she was, what she was supposed to be. And, and so I think it, it, it sort of weakened, weakened, weakened the, the thing. So what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying there is, is that the writing is super important. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Richard. Um, anybody on this side want to ask a question, and then I'll jump over. All right. Oh, did you want... Yeah, hi, Richard. My name's Jackman. Uh, just an interesting point. Do you, did you not, in, back in the day, have a feedback between writer, character, and actor to say, hey, this character's going in a certain direction. Writers, can we take it there? Um, did that not happen, and does that not happen now? Just relating to your last comments. Uh, yes, are, are, are you specifically asking me the, the, the power, or if you like, of the actor to influence the, the way his character or her character is going? Well, if the system is set up that way... We yeah, well, I, I, I think um, it obviously it, it depends on, uh, on your status within the company. I think if one of the doctors um, had uh, felt the characters were going in the wrong direction, they would have considerable influence over the writers. Um, and I was on the program for four years, and um, they began to know the six of us uh, very well and write things to do with our off-stage personality. I was, for instance, given a motorbike to ride a lot, um, because I used to come in on a Honda 50 step through, and they thought I could ride a power bike. But that's, that's another story. Um, so, uh, the were moments, uh, uh, there are, yes, in, in, in a way, some things, probably smaller things for the less important characters, but the Doctor certainly had an influence because um, I was taken on as love interest, for, believe it or not, um, for uh, Katie Manning. That's what I was supposed to be coming onto the show for. Uh, but John Pertwee actually put his foot down because uh, it was nothing personal. He wasn't being sort of bitchy or anything. But uh, he felt that the focus should be on the doctor and the girl and uh, on the story in hand and not sort of get sidetracked into sort of you know, love interest going off all over the place. So you will find in um, my stories that... Um, Katie always shows great concern if I don't turn up, or I show great concern if she's in danger. And I think even in the demons, um, uh, we plan to go to a dance together. Uh, it never happens. You don't actually, we didn't actually go. Um, so, th so there is an influence, but also, of course, the writers sometimes, I'm not sure this must happen a lot, at script meetings where you have a lot of writers uh, involved and the producer um, the writers actually wanted to when we were all leaving the show the writers wanted to blow me up <laughs> they actually wanted to get rid of me uh, in a sort of a dramatic explosion and the producer said no we want to keep the character alive in case we want to use him again Yes. Uh, and so in fact all that happened was I was influenced um, in the, is it the invasion of the dinosaurs? Yes, I think it's called the invasion of the dinosaurs. Yes, invasion of the dinosaurs. Uh, I was influenced uh, to go down the evil path of the baddies uh, and try to establish the golden age on Earth. And thinking that that is what I was supposed to be doing, I when I discovered that I was, uh, the doctor was about to be attacked and eaten by a uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex. I realized that I had actually nobbled his stun gun and he would be eaten, dead. And um, I do the incredibly brave thing and, and uh, uh, leap forward and, and, and shoot the dinosaur, realizing that I had taken the wrong path. So uh, that was that was that was how that one came about. I um, 
You might, I, I saw this video. Yes. I, I saw this video that um, Albert found when we were doing research again. Yeah. And was it the finale, Albert, where they were having a conversation about how the actors did have influence to change some lines? Was yeah, it the finale? It was the end of the episode. Uh, end of a particular storyline. And I, I thought this was interesting because um, in the interview that I saw, they were talking about how um, the doctor had some lines over here, and I think it was you and another actor who said, can we try something out here? And the line was about that. Oh, yes, no, yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about. Um, at the end of The Demons, um, the, um, uh, John, well, all of them, except the Brig and myself, uh, were standing on the village green, the master, uh, they're all dancing around a maypole with all the coloured ribbons. And as they dance around, they tie the master up to the to the maypole. It's, it's, it's lovely. And they all had, you know, that was the climax of the film. And Nick Courtney and I, the brigadier and the captain, were standing at the side of the green, watching and not taking part. And I thought, hey, hang on, we've, we've had a, one of the best stories that's been written, and we're not given an exit line. And um, so I sort of had a little thought. Uh, we were actually standing next to the pub, uh, which was called the Cloven Hoof, I think. And um, uh, the brigadier was quite fond of a pint. And um, I th thought quickly, and I turned to Nick Courtney, and I said, look, Nick, I've got an idea for a final line, and, and we could have a close-up here. Um, do you mind if I go and suggest to Barry Letts, who was the producer, uh, and that we're not just left on the side of the green, but we could just have this exit. And he said, yes, okay, okay. So I rushed off to Barry and I said, look, what I would like to do is I'd like to uh, say to uh, Nick Courtney, seeing everybody else dancing around the maypole, I turned to him and say, fancy a dance, Brig? And the Brig looks, looks back at me and he says, no, thank you, Captain Yates. I think I'd rather have a pint. <laughs> and um, anyway, Barry Letts was a wonderful producer, and that was certainly a case where um, I, you know I wrote my own exit line from the from 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 the show. We have a question over here from Josie. Um, what from would you say is like the best like impact since all the? Can you wave your hand? I can't see where you are. Hello. Oh, there you are. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you say is like the biggest impact? since they've like advanced on like the special effects and everything like yeah the, the, the biggest uh, special effects like, effect yeah like what would you say like the impact on like the storyline and everything has been um well i can tell you what had the biggest impact on me um uh, and um that was um I forget which story it was, but we, it was the one where we had globby axons. And the globby axons were rather revolting creatures, aliens, who had their, all their veins on the outside. Um, you, you're remembering which one it was? Claws of Axos. Sorry? Claws of Axos. Claws of Axos, was it? Thank you very much indeed, sir. Thank you. And Claws of Axos. And um, um, we had one absolutely brilliant effect which was, um, I think, uh, I clambered onto a jeep in, and was, I think, struggling with, with um, globby axons in the back of the jeep. I either fall off or jump off, and the, uh, the jeep explodes. Uh, it was a, a very important effect. Um, but what had the greatest effect on me personally was we did a studio shot uh, in which in which uh, uh, at one point the actual set looked very solid, like this room. But in fact, this lovely white wall which I was standing beside um, was made of polystyrene. And suddenly this awful hand came bursting through the wall. <laughs> so uh, that had an effect on me. I don't think that's quite an answer to your question, but <laughs> it's about as near as I can get. 1970s special effects. Yeah. Um, Richard, just over here, um, just quickly, um, I came in uh, at my age, John Pertwee, I came in just at the end of John Pertwee's Doctor Who, Tom Baker being my doctor to go on with. Um, in terms of Captain Yates, uh, one question that occurs to me, 
who, who do you think he preferred to work with of those two doctors? Not necessarily you as an actor, but Captain Yates as the character. Was, would he particularly prefer any one of, one of those two doctors that he would have worked with? Um, no, I think actually, uh, I think Tom Baker was a brilliant casting uh, after John Pertwee. And they had quite a few similarities because they were both pretty eccentric. In, 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 in their various ways. Uh, Tom, who I've worked with since, in fact, only a couple of years ago, I did um, 15 CDs with Tom Baker, uh, called Demon's Quest, have you heard those? Audio. Uh, <laughs> look, he's got one, he's got one, lovely. Uh, Demon's Quest, Serpent's Quest, what other names were there on there? Hornet's, Hornet's Nest. Hornet's Nest, Demon's Quest, Serpent Crest. No, that's what... uh, yeah, there were actually five, um, I think we did five, I know we did three series, those, those were the three, those were the three, 15, 15 CDs. Um, uh, I love working with both, personally, and the thing is that um, Captain Mike Yates and I are actually pretty close. I mean, I was actually a, a, a captain in the army, in the Royal Green Jackets, uh, now known as the Rifles. And actually, this seems to be a good moment, if I may, to, um, yeah, um, this is a, a novel that I wrote called Operation Hate, which describes what happened to Captain Mike Yates when he left, very sadly, uh, unit, and he left the planet of the, after the planet and the spiders. And it's an adventure novel, and it's based actually on a, a journey I had to Morocco once. Um, and it, I think it'd make a wonderful film because it goes to all sorts of great locations um, North Yorkshire, London, uh, Gibraltar, Morocco and various other places as well and actually as you see it's in paperback it's, it's done pretty well but I should be selling copies of that here if you I've got 12 copies I brought with me that's all because of weight um, so anyway. What, what time is the, what time are those copies being sold? Do you remember? Uh, signatures at was it three thirty? Uh, I think two thirty or so. Yeah. Um, two thirty to five. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> so if you um, if you want the copies of uh, if you want the copies of the books, they'll be down there as well. Yeah. So so they're, 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 they're um, uh, right. Well, yes, we won't do it now. I'll, 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 we'll do it when at the end of the session, if you, if you want to come and get some. That, that's absolutely but, um, fine. Um, sorry, what was the question again? Because I didn't really get to the final answer. Oh, the question was... Um, oh, which doctor did I like working with? with? Mike Yates. Like. Did like Mike Yates like working with? Well, I think Mike would have liked working with both of them. Because um, uh, as this little book, this is what, what, I'm, what I'm saying, has a lot of my personal autobiography in it. But I don't write it as Richard Franklin's autobiography, I write it as Mike Yates's autobiography. And um, both Mike Yates and I were very happy working with both those two doctors. Uh, and there is a good reason. Um, uh, they were both brilliant up here. Um, the, uh, 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 and they were both um, wildly extravagant in their ideas, but they needed bringing to earth. And um, I personally felt that I was the right person to bring them to earth, in a way, you know, a very practical um, soldier, but a soldier who also can appreciate a bit of eccentricity around the place. So um, I, I think that Mike Yates, to directly answer your question, would have been equally happy working with either. Unfortunately, I wasn't given the opportunity because, of course, we, when the Doctor regenerates, um, everybody goes with him. That's the other five of us who all go with him. Well, four, in fact, because, of course, the lovely Roger Delgado, who played the Master, had, uh, had died. In, in, in a very tragic accident um, in uh, Turkey when he was filming in one of the breaks from Doctor Who. Uh, I've got, actually, there are two stories that come to mind that I'd like to tell you. Uh, one is directly on this, the, the, this point. Um, uh, we were filming the Green Death um, about the maggots who turn into rather nasty creatures. Um, in 
a little village in North Wales, in South Wales, called Ababagoed, and it, we were filming on a, a, a brand new factory up there. And after a day's filming, Roger Delgado and I went back to our hotel, and the AD came up and uh, gave us our call for the next day. Uh, in a hurry, he came up, said, "Your call is six o'clock tomorrow morning," and he rushed out. And Roger rushed out with him. And I thought, hey, hang on, what's, what's happening? Where's he going? And uh, they, I could see them talking outside the hotel door. And Roger came back in. And he said, Richard, I hope you don't mind, but I've just asked the um, unit, if uh, the AD, if um, we can be called tomorrow morning at half past five and not <laughs> six. So I said, well, no, I don't mind. Uh, you know, six in the morning is horrible, and half past five is horrible, so that's fine, you know. And um, I said, but then it, why? And Roger was very meticulous as an actor and as a driver. And he was a very careful driver, very, very, very punctilious. And he said that he never trusted unit drivers. And we were going, he was filming in Turkey afterwards, uh, and, uh, and he, uh, well, yes, I've jumped the gun a bit. He rather than the driver that was driving us on Doctor Who the next day had plenty of time to drive safely and carefully to the location. The irony was that in the break when he was filming in Turkey, they were late, the plane was late or something, and the film driver was rushing and drove him over a precipice into a ravine and he died. Um, so it was rather ironic yeah. that that should have happened. Um, the other story is a, is, a, is a funny one and I hope there is a, a, nobody under 16 years here because it's a rather sort of a <laughs> dubious story. Um, but I prom promise you I won't be any swear words. Uh, in the um, Invasion of the Dinosaurs, when I'd nobbled the Doctor's stun gun, um, in those days our budget was very small compared with today when the effects of the budget so large they can have these wonderful effects. So the BBC were economising and the Tyrannosaurus Rex that I had to shoot dead, um, in fact, was just one leg. Um, and the BBC couldn't afford the other three. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I rushed forward with my gun, and I aimed, as I thought, uh, under the um, Tyrannosaurus's armpit, um, uh, and which I thought would be the best way of getting to his heart and kill him, stone dead. Actually, it was the Tyrannosaurus's back leg. <laughs> Do I need to explain any more? <laughs> so I shot the wrong bit off the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah. Do you have a question over there? Yeah, just to the right here, um, Richard. Um, Dave has a question. Just been waiting to ask a question for a little while, but you've actually led towards it. You come from an era where there was a lot of black and, black and white film photography and then it changed to colour. You've got your own storybook which you've written, which tells basically where the captain went after he left the doctor. Is there the likelihood that you could introduce your publication to the likes of Gil, my, 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 sorry, uh, Neil Gaiman, who's one of the concurrent writers, to be able to tell a retro story that would basically deal with your captain going around, but tell it in black and white, which has been done in a couple of recent television series that they've broadcast in the last few weeks, that they found that that particular, going back in that old technology of using black and white to film a, a particular episode, could be useful to maybe bring back some of the older fandom who have lost faith with the current Doctor's, doctor scripts and the current Doctor and the, and the companion which we are now aware that come Christmas we're, we're seeing some new characters to, turning up. Is there a prospect that you could approach either Neil Gaiman or as one of the current writing team to take, take your storyline as a treatment for a, for a possible story arc? since we have brought back the, cat, the Brigadier's daughter as one of the, and we're introducing at various times the Doctor's wife, and at one stage we've actually had a Doctor's daughter, which ironically is, apart from just meeting up on the set, is actually part of the family. It's all coming together. And that's a, 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 a very 
Uh, that's a, a very interesting idea, and I certainly would love to do it. I, I think I'll wait till the new producer comes in. Um, because uh, I, I, a lot of people have said to me, could we not uh, you know, bring Mike Yates and others back? Um, and I think the idea of, of, of uh, uh, combining black and white with colour is, 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 a, is a very good idea. I certainly will when there's been a change. I will, I will uh, get my agent to uh, suggest an idea. In fact, if I could just mention this black and white business, uh, I think the, mi the Mind of Evil was shot originally in black and white, and the BFI, uh, British Film Institute, um, had a, a showing, which I was invited to, of the colorization of The Mind of Evil. And it was quite stunning. I, I, the technology has been explained to me. Um, I didn't understand it, and I can't explain it to you. But it's quite brilliant to go from black and white to the most convincing, beautiful color. And it was on a vast screen, you know. Um, but uh, in fact, um, the retro idea is a good one. Um, and have you heard of a company called Big Finish? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, Big Finish, um, I did a story about how I get into, um, I wish I could remember the, the, the title of it. You probably know. You don't. Oh, sure. <laughs> My source of information here is, has dried up. Um, uh, but one of the Big Finish stories uh, shows uh, Mike Yates um, um, uh, uh, just doing a, a regular army job and uh, he gets co-opted on the spot into uh, into unit uh, but I think there's much more to be told I, oh I know what it was called it was called the something to do with stones yeah, yeah. we got one here what? oh you have what's it called? <laughs> the vengeance of the stones yeah, the, the, what is it? the vengeance of the stones the vengeance of the stones <laughs> the oh, wonderful <laughs> Excellent. What else have you got in that bag? <laughs> have you got a new contract for me? <laughs> He's got them all. What's that one? Oh, the rings of Ikeria. Yes, that's uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, another one. I've done quite a lot of work with uh, uh, audio work uh, for Big Finish, who are a, a great a great company, and I couldn't mention Big Finish without mentioning lunch. Because um, we all do, we all get given the most fantastic lunch when we go there. Because the studio owner, uh, uh, Toby, um, uh, Toby Robertson, who, who also uh, produces uh, uh, technically, uh, he um, is a chef. He produces this wonderful lunch for us all. And as you know, soldiers always march on their stomachs. Uh, so do actors. Yeah, sorry, can you take a mic? Because I can't. Just a point of interest. One way where your, your storyline could actually come in. At one stage, we visited the, the the Universal Library, where there's every book and ever written in history. And for some reason, your particular book happens to turn up somewhere, and that could be the introduction of the story arc. And then, hence, it takes them back through the the retro perspective. But that would be one way of where your written word gets the physical publication, but turns up in the storyline. That's a very and, good idea. Would you, an interesting would you, page turner to leap in and then take your, take your line with a, with a Neil Gaiman treatment, because his, his scripts have been recognised as being some of the, the best written, uh, child-friendly and very thought-provoking scenes. Um, I think there was one with the trees that was one of the most strong uh, Christmas-type period storylines that actually got... It was scary. It was, Gaiman's um, a genius. He's an absolute genius. Actually, one of the very best scripts that we've had in a long time. Yeah, very good idea. It's a very good idea. I was thinking um, if we could have uh, maybe just one more question before. Sorry, sorry, right? I think you, did you have a hand up before? Two yeah. more questions. I've got, got two questions. Yeah. Well, he's, kind of, what you ask? he's kind of answered one of them because I was going to ask about uh, Tom Baker. Uh, <laughs> my name's Rose. Uh, I was going to ask you about the difference as people of Tom Baker and John Pertwee, uh, because you've worked with uh, Tom outside of Doctor Who. Who do you like better? 
Uh, well, I'm not going to answer which one I like best, uh, but I certainly could uh, tell you a difference between them. I mean, uh, Tom is very intellectual. Uh, he's got a very, very good brain. Uh, and, uh, and John, I would say, is a superb showman. Uh, once when we were filming in, uh, I think it's called Return to Devil's End or something, uh, in Albourne, the little village where we originally filmed the demons, um, John was the last person to join the group of us on the green uh, prior to uh, working on that particular scene. And his charisma is so great that you could actually feel it in the open air in a field. I mean, uh, he, and he was, he was a very big personality. He was a tall man, big craggy face, but uh, he was also, in the nicest possible way, the life and soul of the party. I mean, he was a very big personality. Um, John also is a, uh, Tom also is a, is a big personality, but uh, he's much more uh, intellectual. In fact, um, at, um, Nick Courtney's memorial service at St. Paul's uh, Church in Covent Garden. Um, I received a very uh, nice phone call uh, from the family, uh, because I was a good friend of Nick's, uh, saying they had discovered a poem among his papers that he was particularly fond of, and would I read the poem in the church for his memorial service? And that was the sort of penultimate Thing, but the the most important um, um, event at the service, of course, is the eulogy. And Tom, who is a very close friend of Nick's, um, read the eulogy, and it was stunningly brilliant. Because you don't want to be sort of too mawkish and you know depressing. You want to cheer people up. But on the other hand. Uh, you've got to be careful not to just make inappropriate jokes and, and so on, you know, that's not the right moment for it. And Tom hit that very delicate line extraordinarily carefully. He, he was so funny, actually, because, you know, he, he doesn't really care what he looks like or anything like that. And he came, do you know a, a French comedian, uh, an old French comedian called Fernandel? Probably not. He's sort of French films of way back, a very, a very marvellous, very physical comedian. And um, he sort of shambles, this comedian sort of shambles along. Well, anyway, <laughs> for, I read my poem, and um, then Tom got up to do the eulogy, and he shambles up onto the steps just in front of the altar, carrying a shopping bag, a plastic shopping bag in his hand, uh, looking literally as if he'd just come straight out of Waitrose. And, and he then just spoke without a note, absolutely fluently and absolutely brilliantly, about his friendship with Nick Courtney. And, uh, but, so yes, one very intellectual, the other a great showman. Thank you. Uh, this is our last question. Do you want to introduce yourself? Okay, I'm Jay, and I want to ask about Big Finish. So you've done lots of stories with them. Um, you've done the Companion Chronicles. You did that Death Near the Doctor was mentioned before, and you've even done a lost story that was going to be made but wasn't ultimately. And um, what has been your best experience with Big Finish? What was sorry? What was the experience of the best experience that you had working oh, with the Big best Finish? Experience. Lunch. <laughs> um, no, actually, to, to take it a, a bit more seriously, um, I think it's really difficult to remember all the um, uh, things, but I can tell you the worst insults I ever got from Big Finish. They asked me to play, um, oh Lord, I've now forgotten, um, what was that awful potato head uh, alien they had? Sontara. What? Sontara. Sontara, no, it wasn't that. But they're the... Uh, another another one. He had a very big, thick. Very big, thick head. The race is Sorry. The pale ones. Not the grey ones. The pale. Well, anyway, it's one of the the most ugliest, horriblest, awfulest aliens out, and they asked me to play his father. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoy the um, 
this, this probably isn't new to you, but the amount of knowledge in this room about the TV series, as you're talking, there are people, you, very knowledgeable, but there are people who can fill in those gaps. It's really impressive. And Well, I tell you, people like you and you and you and you and you and you and you, all of you, know far more about the program. <laughs> I, anything I have learnt about Doctor Who has come from fandom. And I'm not joking. I mean, uh, it's quite extraordinary. They even know how much we earned. They, because they, uh, because the, the little moles get in and they've seen all the contracts and, uh, you know. We're, um, we are close to coming to the end of our time, but I did, because you and, um, I was lucky enough to have a chat in the green room with, with Richard and a uh, topic that we did get onto, and I think it's interesting hearing about other things that actors do that have nothing to do with the industry. I always find that interesting when I meet um, celebrities. And you started talking to me about this, and I asked you to stop so that we could chat about it with everybody, which yeah. is a um, yeah. A thank you. This actually is called the, the Mike and Mac Mag, and uh, the Mike is Mike Yates, and the Mac is Macmillan Cancer Support. Now, this means nothing to you because Macmillan Cancer Support isn't a, a New Zealand charity, and uh, so I'm not trying to collect money from you for something <laughs> that you're not going to benefit from. Um, uh, but you might be interested, those of you that are interested in, who are interested in, in Mike Yates, because this is going to focus exclusively on Mike Yates and what he's up to, and it's interactive, so you can write all sorts of things in. This is just a dummy, it's not for sale, it's free, and I've got 25 copies, which I can certainly, uh, if anybody's interested, you can certainly have, and if you do, have, you will see what it's all about. Um, but it's, it's, it's just another fan mag. But it's not just another fan mag, because that's page one, that's page two, that's page three. You open it out, and you get page four, five, six, and seven. And this in particular, uh, four and six, uh, are, are quite interesting, because I'm going to serialize um, either perhaps a chapter from the book, or my, the play, that, because I write a lot as well, um, uh, Be Called Unit or the Great Tea Bag Mystery, various creative things there. Um, uh, there's also then page seven and eight on the back. It tells you about the charity, but then, as I say, that is not, I'm not trying to get money out of you for this. Um, in fact, the, the money that uh, we get from the magazine, that is after production costs, that's all going to charity, but um, I, I, the, the fans in Britain are going to hear the box rattling in front of them, you're not. Uh, um, but you can ask questions uh, uh, and you can get answers, you can exchange um, stuff that you may have. You may have a, I don't know, a maggot you want to sell or swap for uh, something else. Um, and um, anyway, um, if anybody wants one of these, you can have one of these uh, free. I give them round after the, after this little chat we've had together. Um, but uh, no, I'm, I'm glad to be have the opportunity of mentioning that because actually I was, uh, it was very kindly, but I was a bit cross. I don't really bother to look myself up on the internet, but I did uh, look myself up a, a while ago on uh, Wikipedia. And I found that it was obviously the detail was handed in by a Doctor Who fan because it appeared that I had done nothing else at all but Doctor Who in my career. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I have actually done quite a few other things. Uh, and uh, you mentioned the, this charity thing. Also, I was in politics. involved in politics. I stood as an independent in, I think, every election. I can't, I'm not a good party person. I've been a member of all three parties. But. Um, in fact, more than that, uh, and um, um, so you know, I'm, I'm interested in the world and, and, and other things. I've done lots of other acting, um, so it's nice to have an opportunity to sort of broaden the scope. Oh, the um, when the we, bath killer. When we were doing our research, yes. again, just kept coming across <laughs> things that we've found really interesting. But one of the roles that we heard that you voiced was the acid bath killer. Oh, yes, that's, uh, that's quite funny. Have you ever heard of the acid bath killer? This is for real. No, it hasn't got out here. But, uh, well, there was a very, very notorious murder 
a, a multi-murder uh, case in Britain. Um, and uh, the, this man was called Haig, and he was uh, an acid bath killer. And what he used to do was he used to chat um, rich looking women up in uh, a, a sort of rather posh hotel in central London. And uh, he'd make friends with these women. And uh, he'd then interest them in, uh, they were never as rich as they would like to have appeared to be. And they're the sort of uh, women who had a certain amount of money, but were obviously looking for an investment to become the rich women they would like to be. And um, he would then invite them to come to uh, see his factory in, out of London in Sussex. And um, he would then suggest that they might like to invest and they would make a huge amount of money. And he did this to a number of people, uh, a number of women. Uh, and um, he, at the end of the conversation, uh, he put a bullet through their head and uh, chucked them into a bath of acid so that there was no trace. And he got away with it quite a few times. Well, now it just happened that I have an aunt, Flossie, and um, a very sweet woman, but uh, she was um, a, a, a typical. She and her friend looked a million dollars. Uh, they certainly didn't, didn't have a million dollars, but they used to stay at this uh, rather posh, very genteel hotel called the Onslow Court Hotel in Kensington. And they used to do their shopping in Harrods and have their uh, hair done uh, once a month. And then they'd go back to their little cottage in the country. It is five to one. Oh, is it? Oh, thank you. I really wanted to know that. Um, and um, anyway, uh, Flossie and Sally, her friend, used to go there. And they uh, got to know, or at least, hey, got to know them. And they used to, he used to come and have tea with them in the hotel lounge. And uh, they were next on the list for the acid bath. And um, a friend of mine wrote a play about it. And then Southern Television got hold of the story. And uh, yes, I did an interview on Southern Television about Aunt Flossie. And you must all Google that. Richard, it's been an absolute pleasure to um, have you. I'd love to keep this going on for um, much longer, um, just purely for selfish reasons, actually. But um, thank you so much for your time. Um, Richard has got so much of things down here, uh, paintings, uh, photograph, uh, paintings that were initially photographs, etc. Um, at 2.30 today to 5 o'clock, uh, Richard will be signing signatures where these will also be available. There's a silent auction uh, which uh, was mentioned earlier. Um, and of course the books, which will be available as well uh, during the signature signing. Now tomorrow there's also some opportunities to have photos with Richard and in photo booth too. I can't remember the times there, but certainly those times will be available on the, um, on the little sheets, on the little handouts, pamphlets, etc. Um, so Auckland, please give Richard a, a huge warm... You Thank you very much indeed. I hope I haven't bored the pants off you. Um, uh, off, that is uh, transatlantic pants. Um, I've, um, what I can do is, if anybody wants a copy of the Mike and Mac mag and they think they might like to contribute, because it's, it, it'll only work if people do write in, uh, these are free. Um, I can get them to you now. I can see the lady there.